Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Within Gibson history, the best Les Paul studios you can buy, in my opinion, are the 90s era ebony fretboard version ones. But I was hunting for some guitars in Japan one night, and I came across a model I had never seen before. It's an obscure shop anniversary as well as a Gibson anniversary model, and it takes the best studios ever made and makes it limited edition and special. And so, with a little bit of help from my friend Robert in Japan, I was able to secure this from a shop. So let's go ahead and get this thing out and see what is so special about it. Inside here, my friends, we have the 30th anniversary House of Guitars Les Paul Studio. That might not sound like too much, but wait until you see this thing. BAM! SJ200 inlays! How awesome is that on a studio? <laughs> I guess J200, SJ200, depending on what year. But then everything else about this is what we love about the 90s era studios. Awesome gloss finishes, all gold hardware, jet black ebony fretboards that just look and feel so good. And then you get a little special truss rod cover on this one as well. Now, if they would have went as far as putting a Gibson Mother of Pearl logo on this, then I just would have been so freaked out and happy. But hey, I'll take this as it is, because not only was this the 30th anniversary of that guitar shop that we'll learn about here in a minute, they put that on this pick guard, and it's the 100th anniversary of Gibson, you know, Orville Gibson's first starting date, 1894 to 1994. So this is a double anniversary with just kind of cool inlays, essentially. I'm not sure if they changed out our pickups, because you can't find a lot of information on this one online, so I thought, well, you know, might, might as well bring it back to the USA. I'm thinking I'm going to keep this one back for my personal collection just because of how awesome it is. A limited edition version of my favorite studios that I've always wanted to own one and have one in my collection. And if you're wondering, hey, I love Gibsons. I've been learning all about these things all this time. Why haven't I heard about this one? It's because your answer is right here on the truss rod cover. They only made 30 of these 30th anniversary ones. If you know what you're searching for, I think you can find at least photos of one more of these online. But outside of that, they are hard to find. So first impressions, yeah, love it. Love everything about this. But we should probably learn about what House of Guitars even is, just in case you don't know. House of Guitars is a shop in Rochester, New York. It was first opened in 1964 by Bruce and Armand here in their mother's basement. But then as they started to grow, they eventually got their own very cool looking shop. And their whole claim to fame is they stocked the Beatles gear before they came to the USA. So when everybody was having Beatlemania and oh, I want their gear and stuff, they had the Vox amps already that none of the other stores had. They make sure they had all the country gentlemen's that people would want to purchase as well. And they're still there yet today. House of Guitars, abbreviated H-O-G, HOG. So you can visit them for new and used gear yet today. So it's kind of cool. Something all the way from 1994 was already a 30th anniversary. And here we are in 2022 when I'm filming this episode. So almost the 30th anniversary of the 30th anniversary. So first impressions on this one, it looks like our switch tip might have been replaced. Not a big deal. I can tell it has a little bit of shrinkage going on on the neck, so you can kind of feel a bit of a ridge on the fretboard. That's a bit of a bummer. But this has a full-on Gibson 90s case. It's got the pink case shroud. Oh my goodness. I was wondering what this was. When I opened this up, I saw this weird discolored area on the case shroud, and I thought, uh oh, I mean, is that like heat damage or something? Now it makes sense. This must be a real celluloid pick guard. So if we take this off, we're probably going to see some finish cracking and stuff. Kind of like what we saw in that snakeskin firebird in this episode. So as that has been off gassing, it actually changed the color of the case shroud. Man, that stinks. Another pick guard I have to replace in fear of it destroying my guitar. <laughs> Let's see, do we have any case candy left in this thing? I mean, how did this even end up in Japan? I'm not quite sure. It must have been an esteemed collector who wanted something unique. And that's the same reason why I brought it back. But it looks like we do have our original truss rod tool here and that Gibson USA warranty manual. And since these guys are still around, I thought I would email them to see if they had any behind the scenes information as to why this guitar is the way it is. 
The response was a little bit disheartening. I'm missing a very important piece of case candy on this one that I didn't find out until filming the rest of this review. Les Paul, the man himself, actually worked with House of Guitars in order to design this one. And inside the case was a special clear backplate that had a picture of Les on it and he signed it and it also had all the commemorative writing on it as well. And it was numbered one out of 30. At first I was shocked somebody would replace that, but apparently that was just extra case candy in there. So it was probably just lost at some point in time. Or since it was hand signed by Les Paul, Paul, somebody just kept it for themselves. 90s Gibsons were just fantastic. There's a lot of talk about the whole Goodwood era, and I'm not a big fan of that term necessarily. However, they were using some very choice woods at this point in time, and it was mainly a rebirth of the company. Because you gotta remember, the Henry J team purchased Gibson in 1986. It took them a couple of years to figure out what on earth are they doing, so we get weird things like the Gibson US-1, the WRC models, the various super strats, but then they hit gold with the classics, and then the Ebony fretboard studio. Studios. It's just, yeah, the 90s was a rebirth period of Gibson, very similar to what we are experiencing yet today in the new Gibson lineup now that we've got new management here. So to learn more about the House of Guitars 30th anniversary studio, let's go ahead and throw this on the workbench to take a look at its individual parts and specs before we get to that playing demo. Inside this Les Paul studio, it cleaned up very nicely. I did want to answer somebody because they asked me, how do I get guitars to be this ridiculously shiny? Here's my current method. I went to the automotive department in this episode to try this thing out, the Meguiar Scratch X. After doing some additional testing, that other guitar just had natural black light wear because I have not noticed that on any of these other guitars. So I use that first. That gets rid of a lot of the fine scratches. Now anything extra deep like that, it's not going to get rid of and you're still going to have some polishing swirls. However, when you're done with that, it'll be squeaky clean and it goes doot -doot 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 to the point where the guitar is actually kind of uncomfortable because I had somebody say that's kind of overkill using this and Virtuoso polish. This polish is what gives it that complete mirror-like shine and restores that lustrous, you know, glossy feel. So that's what I'm currently doing now, but every year or two I change up what I do. So let's check out these pickups. What do we have in here? We just have Gibson USA base plates. So that likely means we have the 490R, 498T series pickups. So 1994, this is at least the second official year that you'll have the now modernized Gibson USA base plates. So it's around 92, 93 when they start to use that. However, the 490 series of pickups was around in a roundabout way since the late 80s. It's also possible to find 490R, 490T in the bridge. So the middle position for fun is 4.90. Our bridge pickup reads hot, 13.5. So that tells us that's the 498T. As if that was another 490R, it would be about the same as this. But our neck is 7.7. .7. So sadly, no fancy pickups in here, just the general studio stuff. But that's okay, I quite like the 490R, 498T. Not everybody does though. That is a short neck tenon in our neck and not too much to talk about in our bridge position. Now that would have been really cool had they made this all out of mahogany, but it does appear that we have a maple top. It's hard to tell there, but if you look just right, you can see a seam line right here. Some of these studios will have three piece tops in this era. I'm thinking that's what this one has, judging based on that seam line right here. The other one looks like it's around this area. So this just reads House of Guitars 30th Anniversary. And then if you go onto the back, here's what I'm talking about. The off-gassing will turn gold into a green color and it gets all oxidized. That's the other thing you look for with off-gassed pick guards. But I was pleasantly surprised to find that there is no finish checking in that area. Sometimes the off-gassing of these celluloid pick guards will do that. Now a lot of time that'll completely take over the side of the pickup and sometimes people will try to clean it and they'll lose some of the plating. But right here on the corner you can kind of see that phenomenon starting to happen. So that tells me this likely did not live in its case for too long, otherwise we'd probably have a more extreme version of that on these. Here's another way to know if your pickguard's off-gassing. If one of your screws right here looks like this, the gold plating is just completely gone off of that. Look at how much that's affected our pickguard bracket as well. So it's best to not leave real celluloid pickguards on guitars if you're going to store them in a case. For this video, I'll leave it on. After that, I'll probably just have a regular replica of this made. If I can ever find a shop to do that. I mean, I got a lot of recommendations last time, but none of them really panned through or wanted any more work. To be fair, I did reach out to one company who was going to look for some something very similar to that Firebirds one. But if you yourself make pick guards and you can help me out with that, please do email me. I'm tired of reaching out to companies and getting told no. 
As far as our bridge goes, it was spared most of that, but you can kind of see some pitting right here. That's also caused by the off-gassing of the pick guard. I did not notice any markings on this though. Generally, you'll find like made in Germany still on this time period. However, it's possible this is like when they started to transition out of that. It feels like the rest of the hardware. And our tailpiece has a similar kind of pittingness going on to it. And this one reads made in Germany. So that's definitely original. I'm betting that might be too, but it's also possible it's been replaced. because I'm pretty confident that switch tip has been replaced because it just, it doesn't look right. After you've spent a lot of time with Gibsons, your eye gets accustomed to what should be on there. That just doesn't quite look right. But after we cleaned it up, it's still got some scratches and impressions. Maybe not as clean as I would want it to be. However, this is one of those models that's like good luck finding another one for your collection, right? So there's a very large area of some impressions right here. There you can also see that three piece maple top seam line. Looks like we got a small ding right here. And then there's like a really weird like scratch on each side. It's almost like there was a vibrola plate on here at one point in time. However, there's no screw holes or anything. And honestly, that scratch remover did a pretty good job at hiding that. You gotta catch it at the right angle. There's like that dotted chattered line right here. It just kind of goes up and down in two straight ways. What it probably was is the tailpiece fell off at one point in time when as it fell down. But besides that, we just got a couple of dings. I'm not gonna worry too much about it because again, Find another one. <laughs> I'm sure people will enjoy seeing this one at the future museum. But typical stuff here, two volumes, two tones, output jack located on the side with a gold plate. And being a studio, it is a slightly thinner Les Paul. It still has the maple top and everything, but it's 1.79 inches instead of the standard being a full two inches. So if you tried a standard and you just thought they were a little bit too big, that's another reason why you might consider getting a studio. It's still your regular 913 as far as the body dimensions go. But now let's move on from our maple top mahogany body with the likely nine hole weight relief and move on to our beautiful mahogany neck with ebony fretboard. So we briefly talked about it in the unboxing, but these are J200 crown inlays. You really do not find them on hardly any Les Pauls. A little bit strange, but I love it. It's unique and it makes an already cool guitar even cooler. I was talking earlier how there was definitely some shrinkage of the fretboard. You see this phenomenon, how it kind of dips in between? That's caused by the wood shrinking, but the fret's still being there, so it just kind of keeps the wood in place. So this definitely had some drying out, but I conditioned it. I mean, it's got a little bit of a ridge right here, but I've had way worse than this. And I know I'll be taking care of this one for quite some time, so I'm not worried about it. Beautiful figuring within the mother of pearl on these inlays. Still 24 3 quarters with the 12 inch fretboard radius. And as far as neck dimensions, 1.67 inches at the nut, 2.07 by the 12th, 0.84 at the first fret neck depth, and 0.99 by the 12th. Here's that neck profile at the first and 12th fret. A nice rounded C shape. Definitely leaning more towards a 60s neck, but has a decent roundedness to it. Moving on to our headstock here, we've got some scratches. I didn't bother cleaning this yet because the strings were in the way and they felt pretty fresh, so maybe another day. I just really wish they would have did the Gibson Mother of Pearl logo. That's the only thing this thing was missing from being 100% perfect. But you have your yellow Les Paul model silk screen right here. Our truss rod appears to be in excellent condition and you can kind of see through to the mahogany right there. And I really love the fact that they had them do the brass limited edition truss rod cover because that's a throwback to the original anniversary models like the 2550. You've got things like the Les Paul artist that had these things too. So to have that in 94 is kind of special and it's engraved with the number 22 of 30. Now, if you remember correctly in this episode with the flying V, I said, yeah, I'm not a collector of the limited edition truss rod covers because they're just not as cool to me, but they were used in like 93 and 94. The fact that this one's brass makes me like it instead of being the plastic one. And I'm sure you could easily fake one of this, but it'd be very hard to retrofit this to an existing studio. It just wouldn't be worth someone's time. This does have a very common 90s feature to it. For whatever reason, the lacquer that they were spraying it either wasn't cured correctly or there's just something going on at the factory. But the early 90s, it's very common to get this phenomenon going on on the headstock. What I'm talking about are these lifting areas or where the lacquer starts to bubble. Some headstocks, it gets really bad. There's lines going up all over. The finish starts to flake off the headstock and you have to get it re-cleared. Other times, it's a pretty mild example like this one where you just have a little bit of that phenomenon, but that's very common on a 90s Gibson. 
But anyways, here's the inside of our control cavity. Nothing too crazy. Looks like we have at least one pot that we can read the date code on. So 1994, the 31st week of the year. So these were made very late in 1994, which is kind of strange. House of Guitars must not have been planning too far ahead. Or they were like halfway through the year, like, oh man, we, we need to do this. <laughs> Or it just took Gibson that long to produce them, one or the other. But regular style pots and wiring, you've got your grounding wire right there, nothing too crazy. The back is actually in considerably nicer shape than the top. If we want to get nitpicky, there is a small impression slash scratch right there. And you can see through to the mahogany wood grain, which is pretty cool. And here's what the toggle switch cavity looks like. As far as the edges of this one, nothing too much to report. Very well kept condition. However, you can definitely tell that the strap buttons do have some of that like off-gassing wear to them as well. They're kind of red. Then over here, what you're seeing right there, that's the maple top seam line starting to show. And you got a small ding. That looks a lot worse than it actually is, but you know, it's there. There's just some light lacquer chipping by it. Now we move on up the neck. There's a small ding right here, but otherwise in good shape besides the uh, shrinking lines as we had talked about earlier on the side of the neck. Very similar to what we just saw on the body. And all things considered, a fairly minor case. I mean, when these things start to become really uncomfortable is when you get a sharp edge and then the lacquer starts to chip. Those are the ones that drive me insane. And you pretty much have to re-clear coat them to make them playable. But this one, it's more of a mild annoyance. But another unique feature of this one that I kind of glossed over earlier is the fact that it has this decal. Not every 1994 Gibson got this decal. In fact, there were very few models that got this particular one. So that's just something else that made this one a little bit more special. Going back to our truss rod ones, this is something else that gives it that unique flair without just being on the front of the headstock. So it's like a combination of the custom shop edition decal era and the limited edition truss rod covers. So I like that. Reads Gibson, 100 years, 1894, 1994. And we've got straight up Grover tuners on here. And now our serial number, 94033577. Now Trogly. Are you sure that's not a 1993? You guys have to remember, there's no 403rd day of the year. In 1994, Gibson first utilized that year-year production number sequence that they used from 2014 till mid-2019. So this is 1994, and then this is just a random production number. But we do still have the Made in USA stamp. Now, not all 1994s are like that. You can actually get the Bozeman Montana acoustic guitars. They actually still kept the regular system for some reason. But that trips people up all the time. I bought this one from the Japanese dealer as a 1993. You can always tell the guys who know Gibsons when they're selling them if they get that small detail right. All said and done, not a bad weight, about nine and a half pounds. Nine pounds, six ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how the House of Guitars 30th Anniversary Studio sounds. Perhaps it might even be more acoustically resonant. All right, so I took it off the workbench and tried to play this thing. I was like, oh man, that's really uncomfortable. The action was just set way too high. So I lowered that down a bit and this is, yeah, every bit as good as any other 90s Les Paul studio I've had, but we've got the extra fanciness. So I love this thing. So there's only one obvious song to play on the House of Guitars guitar. So we'll use that for our demo riff. <laughs> Sounds great. So that neck pickup, it's juicy, but not like overly muddy. Almost has a little bit of like that middle pickup chime to it at the same time. But then the middle position sounds like this. X 
extra chimey. Digging that. Now our bridge position, a little bit bitey. <laughs> gonna sound really great with some distortion but I'm digging all these clean tones <laughs> Now that we know all about the hog, Les Paul Studio 30th anniversary guitar, what are my final thoughts on this thing? Absolutely blown away. I love these 90s era Les Paul Studios for a reason, especially when they get the ebony fretboard. So for me as a quirky guitar collector, I always wanted like a really clean one in my collection, but to find one that has, you know, rare unique inlays and just happened to be an anniversary for a particular guitar dealer, that's just really cool to me because this is just the epitome of a collectible. Really kind of reminded me of the Noel Gallagher J150 that we documented not that long ago because it's the same unbound crown fretboard thing going on here. So that was just, you know, a really interesting treat to see these inlays on a Les Paul. Now, generally, dealer anniversaries don't necessarily see huge premiums on the used market, but I think this one's cool enough that it definitely deserves at least a small premium because the inlays are so special. I'll tell you guys what I paid for this one. I paid a little under $2,000 for it. And even though some of you guys might scoff at paying that much for a studio, these ebony fretboard ones in the 2022 market have been selling, you know, between like 12 to 15 for like the really nice ones. So I had no problem paying a small premium for this. And honestly, I think this could probably sell for as much as 2,500. However, th this one's not for sale. It's a nice playing guitar. It's a cool one. You'll be able to see it in my future museum one day. So troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed learning about this really cool 1994 Les Paul Studio. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.